Sam, I'll let you start. Well, it would help if I unmute myself me. first. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome everyone to Pints and Passerines, hosted by the Indiana Audubon Society. And today we have special guest speaker and hummingbird expert and Mary Gray Bird Sanctuary caretaker and manager, Amy Wilms. She is also the Indiana Audubon Society president. So I, um, just so you guys know, we are on Zoom and we have some people on Zoom with us. If you're on Zoom, please just keep yourself muted and use the chat to ask questions. We're gonna hold off questions until the very end um, and then um, kind of get interactive there. We are streaming live to Facebook as well. If you're on Facebook, feel free to type in questions or comments um, in the comment section of the video, but just know we'll get to them at the end and there is about, there can be up to a 20 second delay for those. So otherwise I'm gonna hand it over to Amy to talk about hummingbirds. Thank you so much for joining us today, Amy. You are so welcome. And I am like, I'm thrilled beyond belief to be able to talk about um, the Ruby Threaded Hummingbird tonight. And I know that everyone have, y'all have busy schedules, so we'll get right into the presentation. So, um, so tonight we're going to talk about the Ruby Threaded Hummingbird. And just to give you a little information about myself, I have banded over 6,000 Ruby Threaded Hummingbirds um, in since about 2012 when I started training. And I have banded several at hundreds at the Marigrade Bird Sanctuary. I primarily band there. So although folks say that I'm an expert, I'm always learning. Um, I'm always trying to find more information about them. And um, I absolutely love sharing information about the, the hummingbirds. So um, let's get started and find out what we're um, going to do tonight. I do have another short video clip. I don't know if it's going to start. So I'll just go ahead and we'll get going. Okay, so tonight what we're going to do is we're going to talk about migration, feeding, and breeding. Those are the three main things about the hummingbirds. And I hope that everyone will get some time to come down to the Mary Gray Bird Sanctuary and also see um, how we band the hummingbirds. Not going to go into a lot about banding, but I will give you some really cool data that we have in the Mary Gray Bird Sanctuary from uh, the years that I've banded. Um, it's, it, we're just finding out so much information about what hummingbirds do come back. Um, and I, I just, I thoroughly enjoy it. So let's go ahead and talk about migration. Um, but before we talk about migration, we always have to know how many hummingbirds are there in the world? And I wish that everyone were right with me and you could just yell it out. So there are um, a lot of different species of hummingbirds. There are about 330 different species. Um, and as you see, they come in all shapes, all sizes. Uh, some are so beautiful. My husband and I have traveled uh, to Costa Rica and uh, we've gone to Nicaragua um, and we just, I am always thrilled, um, especially in Honduras, just sitting at a table and just watching the antics of these birds. So they come in different colors. Some are smaller than others and they are absolutely beautiful. So if you ever get to take an advantage of going down um, to Central or South America, uh, take the time to make sure that you sit and just watch the hummingbirds because they are absolutely fascinating. But in Indiana, what do we have? How many do we have? We have one and um, that is the ruby throated hummingbird. And as we talk about migration, I absolutely love the cartoon um, that I've got up. Um, it reminds me every year of, I hope everyone has their feeders up right now, because I'm telling you, they're coming to your feeders. They're, uh, they're already starting, people are already starting to see them in Indiana, uh, and they are on their way up through migration. Um, and that's what I, we, we'll just briefly talk about. 
But yes, we have the one Ruby Thirded Hummingbird. And I do want to thank Sherry McCullough, who took this uh, beautiful picture um, of, the, of the Ruby Throat. It's, these birds um, are totally amazing because they not only, um, they are not only small, they're mighty. Um, and it just in over the winter, they were actually in Central America, mainly in Central America. You may find some in South America too. Uh, and so the Americas are the lucky ones. We all have the ruby throated hummingbirds. So if you go um, to out of the country um, and you're not in Central or South America, you're, you're not going to see the hummingbirds. But we're lucky enough to have the one. And um, and I'm lucky enough because when I catch a hummingbird, I, I primarily have the ruby throated hummingbird and, and I don't have to figure out what species it is, which makes it a little, little easier um, as I band. So the ruby throated hummingbird's migration is uh, primarily based on food source. So most birds, when they migrate, they will migrate from, uh, from areas during the winter where there is a food source, where um, there, the weather is a little better um, or more conducive to their ecology and what they need. And then um, as the ruby throats start coming up uh, from uh, Central America, some will go hop over to Cuba, maybe hop on, on up and fly uh, up to Florida. Some of the ruby throats actually will take from lead from the Yucatan Peninsula and they will fly nonstop up to the, the Gulf Coast, uh, which is quite amazing. So if you think about it, these birds, as tiny as they are, can fly about 525 miles nonstop during their migration up north. Um, and they're, it's quite amazing that they can do that. And they can do that because they have the ability to almost double their weight before, before they fly up. Now, some of our, our ruby throats will actually go along the Texas coast, which it's believed that a lot more go up the coast than actually fly over the water. Because if you can imagine 18 hours nonstop up to 22 hours nonstop, just depending on the winds, and in having to fly over and have nowhere to stop uh, to feed or to rest, uh, that's, that's a feat in itself. So these birds are just totally amazing during their migration. So as far as migration goes, some will come up to Indiana, they'll stick around and they'll breed. But many of them that you're going to see at your feeders right now, and I hope you have your feeders up, many of them are actually going to keep moving on. And so you may see maybe a male usually comes first and they'll start coming to the feeder. You may see them for a day and then you won't see them again because they're hitting your feeders and then they're going on um, up north. They can go up as far as uh, central Canada to breed and but some will hang out um, in, in our area. During banding, I can definitely see um, some of the interesting uh, actions of these birds and how long that they're staying because some of them I'll band and I'll never catch them again. And then other birds I'll band throughout the whole summertime. So as, as I band and the more I band, the more I can figure out if they are going to stay in our location and their breeding or if they're, if they're headed on. Um, to different places and to breed. So um, we have a really large population of the ruby throats. So they're going to hang out uh, in, during in, uh, the, on, in Indiana for several months and then come about September, um, most of them are actually gone and they're going to migrate back down to the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, Central America, uh, very, some may make it as far as Panama, but probably not quite, not a huge population makes it down that far. Um, and some of the uh, ruby throats will actually breed twice uh, in our area. And from our banding data, we actually can see um, some of that. 
So our, our birds are, they're various and they're always trying to find that food source and they're always trying to uh, make sure that they can reproduce in order to continue uh, the ruby throat. So that's a little bit about migration. And as I go along, what I want you to do is I'm really interested in the questions that you have. So the information that I have, I don't have a lot of slides because I want you to think of questions and I'm not going to take a long time for the presentation because I'm gonna have some fun, have you ask questions and hopefully I can answer most of them. So um, we're just going to keep going. But the one thing that we do know about Ruby Throat and Hummingbirds is we don't know a lot. So they're not, they're too small for, to put transmitters on, which would be like a GPS that we could put on, which we are able to do on some birds. However, since um, these little transmitters need to be less than 3% of their body weight, they just haven't made them to last long enough and small enough to be able to track them. So that brings up so many questions that we have about ruby throats. Um, we don't know if more of our ruby throats come fly over the Gulf Coast or if they go around the Gulf Coast. Um, and the reason why we don't know that, it, we know that some do because we have folks who are on boats and they'll, some will land um, when they're exhausted, but we don't have a lot of information. So um, one of the reasons why we banned is to find out those, is try to answer some of those questions. Um, and uh, that's what makes a banding um, enjoy, not only enjoyable, but from a research perspective, it makes it extremely important for us to be able to do this. The other thing about migration that is really fun to know is that the birds that are coming to your feeders are mo have most likely been breeders in your area or were born in your area. So I, I have talked to so many people and I think about this. Has this ever happened to you? Have you ever about this time of year had a hummingbird come up to your feeder or come up to your window and you don't have your feeder up and it just kind of kind of flies around the window kind of saying, hey, you got to put my sugar water out. It happens quite often because we aren't expecting them to come back. However, the birds that do come back, they not only come back to their breeding location, but they also follow the feeders that they've followed in the past. So keeping your feeders out and keeping them clean is really important to them because they need to fuel up and they need to keep moving. Uh, but it's extremely important too because um, these birds actually depend somewhat on our feeders, uh, more so on the plants and the flowers and the bugs um, that, that they need to sustain their energy, uh, but they do come back to the same locations as they're migrating. How do we know that? So I was in West Virginia training uh, to become a hummingbird bander, and I had to spend um, a weekend of four nights, four, four days and four nights, uh, banding hummingbirds at one location with um, the with a person that was a certified trainer for ruby threaded hummingbirds and amazingly enough they had documented over the years of all the trainers that had been there and all the banders that had been at this locate at the location that i was at and i was able to catch a bird that was over eight years old and they were able to document that that bird had had stopped at that feeder for years during that at the same time this, and it, it got caught in the same trap um, and on the about the same day as it had in prior years. But it hadn't been there during during the summertime. So they hadn't banded it prior to, to, to its migration. So we know they stop at the same feeders and we know that they also come back if they make it to that breeding location. So at this point, what I want to do is I, I found a phenomenal video from someone who is an expert in hummingbirds. And um, if you will key it up, Sam, um, I, I, I think everyone will really enjoy this. All right, here is the video. 
if you were to use energy as quickly as a hummingbird, you'd have to eat a fridge full of food or about 300 hamburgers every day in order to survive. Animal ecologist Anusha Shankar studied how hummingbirds use energy across varying elevations in Ecuador in order to better predict how changes in their environment will impact their range. They're endotherms, so they manage their body temperature at a constant, and thermoregulation, which is maintaining that constant temperature, is 30 to 40% of what they're spending their daily energy on. They use energy so quickly because they fly so, so fast, and a lot of the flowers they feed on are really delicate, and if they were to perch on them, then they would pull the flower off. They have to hover in one place, which is really energy consuming. It's one of the most energetically expensive activities in the animal world. Hummingbirds flap their wings around 70 times a second and up to 200 times a second when they're diving. Their hearts can beat more than 1,200 times a minute. The average resting heart rate of a human adult is 60 to 100 beats per minute. So they use energy really, really quickly in order to survive. So hummingbirds have the highest metabolic rates of all vertebrates during the day. But at night, they're almost at the opposite end of that spectrum. Most hummingbird species seem to be able to use torpor at night. And torpor is a strategy which is kind of like nighttime hibernation or hypothermia, where they lower their body temperature to save energy. They're really tiny. The smallest hummingbird is like the weight of a dime, and the largest is 20 grams, which is maybe nine dimes stacked together. They don't have much room to store fat. If you were really heavy with fat, then you wouldn't be able to fly. So they have to feed on nectar many, many, many times during the day. If hummingbirds didn't have flowers to feed on, they would starve in as little as two hours. So next time you need a snack, be thankful. It's not a life or death situation. So Anusha has some great information about hummingbirds. And um, so, and when I saw that video, I just thought that brings, that it, it compacts a lot of information about our hummingbirds. Um, and, and it includes the ruby throats. And one, of, one thing that I actually uh, was really interested in was how she talked about uh, the flowers um, in your yard. So, Think about the energy that a hummingbird has to expend when they are trying to feed. So if I have a bunch of flower, uh, flowers, native flowers, in a very concentrated area, I don't have to spend as much energy if I have all of those in a concentrated area than if I have one flower here and one flower there and, and maybe a few um, insects over here. I have to spend a lot of energy to be able to hit all of those flowers in order to um, have the energy to sustain me. But if they're in a very concentrated area, it makes a huge difference for, for the birds. She also um, goes in and she talks about um, the torpor, which she alluded to a little, but she also says that when um, her, one of her research studies was about um, torpor with breeding females. And she found that breeding females don't go into torpor, which is, is, is a phenomenal uh, thing for them to do is that, so they're not feeding at night, uh, they, but they have to sustain themselves. And a part of the research question is, how do they do that? So our ruby throats need to feed about every hour and uh and if they feed uh, 18 hours a day so uh and then a female is able to not only thermal regulate herself she's able to raise those young and she's able to make it through the night without without any eating eating um and she's trying to help uh raise those young uh, and then when you think about how they uh have two broods so a female is going to be not only building her nest, but she's also um, going to be laying her eggs. And she's, she's working about five weeks at a time to raise those young. And that's five weeks of not going into torpor. And the big question is, how do, how do these females do it? 
Um, so there are a lot of questions. So now I wanna talk about feeding. So I hope, again, everyone's got their hummingbird feeders up because those migrants are starting to come through and you may have a few scouts that are going to stay at your location. Um, and I thought the best way to do it instead of giving you a slide was to actually talk about feeding and show you the feeders that I actually really, I, I like to use and how I make my sugar water. Because there are so many myths out there about um, sugar water and how to make it and if you have to boil it or you don't have to boil it. So let's just get down and dirty and let's just make some. I figured that would be the easiest way. So I have my pitcher here. And if you all have been making it for years, you, you might make it a little different. Um, in the past, we were always told that we needed to boil the sugar water and the water before to make it um, that would help dissolve the sugar. And um, however, what we what hummingbird banders and researchers have found is you really don't need to do that. Um, it doesn't make it the it doesn't make your sugar water last any longer. Um, not only that, as soon as that first hummingbird comes to your feeder, your feeder's already contaminated with whatever you tried to do to boil all of the contaminants out. So it's really unnecessary to do. And I have my bag of sugar and just um, plain old sugar. Uh, it's upside down. I won't turn it over because it's actually open. Um, and so before I, I start to make it, I, I kind of want to make a point here. Um, it's extremely important to only use your white plain table sugar. Um, you do not want to use the brown stuff, the raw sugar. Don't use the equal. Don't use any of the pink stuff or even the yellow stuff. Don't use honey. Don't add anything to it. All you need, and save yourself money, you don't need to go to the store and purchase anything. Save money, just make your own. So to make it, at this time of year, I just highly recommend, there's no reason to make uh, a huge batch of it because you're not gonna have very many hummingbirds coming to your feeder yet. Um, you just wanna have enough to uh, keep it fresh so just make a small one and i've just got a quarter of a cup um, of to be able to to be able to uh, make this so i'm just going to take my quarter of a cup and i'm going to just i'm going to put it into my pitcher so it's a four to one ratio four to one so i've got a cup of water here now i just pour it right in so this water i actually it's a little warm uh, i just went to the sink, I uh, used warm water, mix it up, just, uh, you know, take your, take your spoon, or I've got this nice little mixer here because um, at the Mary Gray Bird Sanctuary, we do go through a lot of sugar. Um, my guess is about 100 pounds a year, so a season. So you just put, uh, this is nice, you just put that on the lid on, and this little thing goes up and down, it mixes it, um, give it a couple of minutes, pour it into your feeder, and you're good to go. Don't let it set outside too long. The hotter it gets, the faster it's going to ferment, and you don't want to give that to um, a hummingbird. So um, just, I recommend uh, this time of year, if it's not that um, hot outside, you can probably leave that in your feeder for eh, about a week if it's not hot. But once it starts to warm up, um, we usually change our feeders at the sanctuary about every other day, if not every day, because once it gets up into that 90 to 100 degree weather, you really wanna keep it fresh. Every time you, uh, every time you start to fill your feeders, um, don't top them off. So take your feeder, and make sure that you wash it good and clean. And the easiest way to wash these feeders is hot water. That's all, don't use soap. You don't need to use, you can use about a 10% bleach solution. Not necessary if you're keeping these clean and you're regularly cleaning these. Um, if you are determined to use soap or anything else, just 
make sure that you rinse them extremely well and get all the residue off. Ruby throats are extremely picky about their feeders. They know when the sugar water isn't fresh and they'll be coming to your window and telling you to fill, fill your feeders um, and clean the sugar water. So if it gets cloudy, it's time to, it's time to change it out. And then I also like to talk about um, the importance of a good hummingbird feeder. And this, uh, this one that I have is the one that we actually use at the sanctuary the most. Um, and the reason being is because it is so easy to clean. Um, you, you don't need a fancy metal um, hummingbird feeder or glass. Um, these do come in glass, which is absolutely fine. Uh, but this, the nice thing about this is if you look, it's got a great opening. And that makes it extremely simple to clean. Plus, these feeders are less than $10. Um, and we do have some at the Mary Bird Sanctuary if you're ever interested in um, picking one up. But the second part about this feeder is it is so simple to clean because there's only three parts to it. And it's a little wet because I just cleaned it. Um, I had it out and I wanted to show it as a demo. But as you see, very simple to clean. I don't have to do a lot. Again, hot water takes care of it. Little scrub brush if, uh, if it gets black. Um, and a little moldy. Ours usually don't because we're changing them so often. And then, so once you're done, you just put this back together, you fill your water up, put it upside down, and then it's ready to hang. So that's a great feeder during the summertime. Um, there are other great examples out there. I'm not trying to, to say that this is the best one, but this is what we use because it's extremely convenient. Um, and then a lot of people ask, what happens um, in the late summer? You know, when you get the, uh, the bees that are coming out and the wasps, um, when you have a problem with bees or wasps, the one feeder that absolutely is wonderful to use is this feeder here. Um, this one is called a Humsinger, but on Amazon, you can find all different kinds um, of, of feeders, but um, of Humsingers. This is a great one because it's actually larger than a lot that you'll find at the store. I think this one is actually 16 ounces, so um, it holds more sugar water. And the idea is you just don't fill it up all the way to the top because um, then the ants um, and the bees, they cannot reach the sugar water. And, one, and the, the other nice thing about this one is it has a built-in ant trap. Now, this isn't very big, so we, we um, do use another piece to keep um, the ants from coming in. But um, you can put water in this part. Do not, and I will repeat, do not use, put soapy water, don't put Vaseline um, or bleach or anything like that. Because the thing is, if you were watching the video at the beginning of the presentation, you would have seen that there was a, a hummingbird that was sitting on the top of one of these feeders, or it was sitting on the top of one of our ant moats that I'm going to show you. Um, and they do use those to drink water out of. So don't add anything to it, just plain old water. That's all you need to put in that. But again, these are great during the fall. Uh, you can use them throughout the whole season. And it makes no difference. Um, but uh, so, if you do have ant problem or uh, ant problems or flying insect problems, uh, this is the feeder that you would that I recommend. Um, and then the last thing that's really important when you're feeding, um, it's an ant moat, and that's what this is. So a lot of people always ask, how do you get the ants to stay out of the uh, out of your feeders? Um, and the ant moat just goes on top like this. And all you do is you take some water, you put it in here, and then when the ant is trying to uh, climb on the pole and climb down to the feeder, it gets stopped because of the moat. So it's got water and that stops it. These are um, about, I think, $5 on Amazon. They will save you a lot of struggle trying to keep those ants out. Um, it is believed that if you have a lot of ants around your feeders. The other thing that you wanna do is take just water, just some warm water, 
when you hang your feeder up, make sure that you take the, the warm water maybe with a sponge and sponge things off because you know when we're filling these and as we're carrying them out to hang them up, some of the sugar water splashes out inevitably and um, it gets on the outside of the feeder. And once that happens, that's when the insects um, and other uh, critters like to, um, like to go to the feeder because they can get it from the outside. Uh, and then sure that it's your feeders are sealed really well because if it's not sealed, you're going to have a problem again with ants and, and flying insects. So if, it, if you are having a lot of problems, again, don't use any, don't use Vaseline to try to seal it. You definitely just want to either pitch it and get a new one um, or just, or make sure that you keep these extremely clean. Um, you don't think you spill anything on the outside when you're putting them up, but you never know. Um, you could do that. Um, the last thing that I do want to mention is please do not use any red dye um, or like uh, your Gatorade or anything like that. And why wouldn't we do that? It's because the four to one sugar ratio that we use is it it is conducive to what a hummingbird um, drinks out in the wild so uh, that's why we don't add anything and when i talk about the the red dye um, people will ask well why um, and number one do we have any research backing that we don't want to use red dye and honestly, no, we don't. Um, and the reason why we don't have really good solid research is unfortunately the only way that we would find out if red dye was bad for hummingbirds is we, we would have to take deceased hummingbirds that we knew were, were drinking red dye and um, we would have to look at, the, at look at dead hummingbirds, which we don't want to do. So simplest thing is don't use it. Um, and that, that just solves the problem. And when I band, I, I do catch, um, I, each year I'll have three or four hummingbirds that their urine is red. So that's when I know that it's usually the next door neighbor has put out their feeders because they see all of the hummingbirds that are coming through on migration. And I immediately know that they've put their feeders out. Or I know that I have a new bunch of hummingbirds coming through because we don't use the red dye. And when they urinate, you can actually see the red. So no red dye, you don't need it. Um, it's not going to attract them any, any, any more or any less. So, so you don't need it, don't use it. So that's a lot about the feeding um, of the hummingbirds. You know, they, they need to eat a lot. They need to eat during the day. And um, we wanna make sure that putting our feeders out is extremely, it's, it, it's important, but it's for our enjoyment. Uh, hummingbirds not only eat at our feeders, but they also need bugs and gnats and, and critters. Uh, they'll eat small fruit flies. Um, that's protein and that's energy and that means fat. So um, our hummingbird feeders are truly um, our way of, of trying to enjoy the hummingbirds. Um, but not as important. So we need also native flowers. So the best thing that you can do for a hummingbird is not only have your feeders hanging out, but also have native plants around because native plants bring in the native insects that we need. And that's what helps feed them and keep them alive. So I hope that those tips helped um, and I'm sure folks will have a lot of questions. So I'll be happy to answer those here at the end. Um, and what we're going to do next is let's um, talk a little bit about the breeding of the uh, ruby thirds. Let me go back to my presentation here. And I'm just going to scroll down. Because the breeding um, is fascinating because these, these little, <laughs> they're really, really small birds. And they, um, and, these, and these birds during their, um, during their breeding, they have to work fast, they have to work efficient, 
and uh, and we and it gives us time to not only enjoy them but they have a lot of work to do in the very short amount of time when they're here so i always like to go in and tell folks what the difference between a male and a female ruby throated hummingbird is and my husband has agreed to come in and and help us just give you a little idea about the differences between the male and the females and um, this is Carl. Hello. <laughs> so on your left is? That's a really good looking male hummingbird. And the male hummingbirds are well known for their beauty and their aggressiveness at the feeder, defending territory, and, and what providing else? sperm to make the young. And uh, they're really good looking yeah. and they provide sperm yeah. and they uh, defend territory. Yeah. And they help build the nest, right? No, they're good looking. Um, let's see, what else? Do they help feed the female during the summer when she's sitting on the nest? Working? He protects the flowers that he likes. Um, does, what else does he do? Looks good. Okay. Provide sperm. Okay. Uh, come on, uh, anything else? Hey, there are important things in this world. All right. And sometimes a man's got to step up and do it. All right. So, so for the ruby loaded hummingbird, the male <laughs> does not match. Um, looks good. Yeah, looks good, migrates. Um, but let's talk about what the female does. So, the female ruby throated hummingbird. She's the worker bee. She's the one who does m most, well, all of the raising of the young. So the first thing that she does is she flies back a couple weeks after the males. And then she'll set up her, um, her territory. So she primarily, to build her, the area that she'll build her nest is an area where she finds a great, a, a good food source. So it's got to have a lot of gnats and bugs and flies and small spiders um, and some native plants so that she can feed. Um, so that's the first thing that she does. And, and a couple, a uh, few days after she gets back to her breeding area, then she is going to start building her nest. And as she builds her nest, she's going to use spider webs is what, what uh, makes that nest stick on the branch. And then she's going to take a few other native materials within her area um, to fill the nest in. Um, she may use some cattails, um, some small leaves, um, and she'll take that, that spider web material and, and that's what helps it stick together. And then she's going to take lichen and she's going to put that around the nest. And the lichen is so that other um, predators don't find the nest. Just like me, um, I've lived at the Marigray Bird Sanctuary for 15 years now, going on 16. And have I ever found a ruby throated hummingbird nest? Never. So they're extremely hard to find. She has to conceal those. So she's building her nest and then she starts to mate with a male. And, um, and as she mates with the male, then, um, then she's going to incubate, she's going to lay two eggs about two days apart. And she is going to incubate those for about 14 days. And once those um, young are born, they are born naked. They don't have, they have no clothes on, they have no feathers on. Um, and so she is constantly caring for her young. And that takes about, she'll be on feeding them for about three weeks and then she will fledge those young. But what's amazing about this, this female is in Indiana and, um, and down north, these, these birds will actually breed twice. So if, if they're lucky and conditions and the weather and everything is on their side. So once she is starting to fledge her first two, at the same time, she's starting to build another nest in another location so that she can be prepared for another five-week stint of raising, her, raising two more young. 
and then she'll be ready, she'll prepare to migrate. So as these birds are, when they're born, um, they are totally dependent upon their parent, um, that female. And as she's feeding them, she's feeding them constantly um, and they grow extremely fast. And um, so once, once they're grown in about three weeks, they'll take off of the nest and um, they may stay with the parent, for the mother for maybe about two, no more than three days. And once that happens and once she's done, then um, mom is all done. So these birds are um, very, they're individuals. They don't fly in flocks. They don't stay in their family unit. Um, they are singular once, um, once they've been fledged off of that, off of that nest. So she's got her two young. She's already, she's already taking care of those. The eggs are about the size of a, tic, a white Tic Tac. So anytime you go into a store or you pop a Tic Tac in your mouth, you can think about the size of a ruby throated hummingbird um, egg. So, um, and then the, and just to give you a little idea about what that male is doing, um, he is protecting his feeder. He is um, helping to find as many fem females as he possibly can. Um, and he's protecting his territory. And a lot of people talk about how um, during um, mating season, it's really fun to watch the males because they, in order for them to, I kind of say, show off to the females, um, if you're lucky enough to be outside when they do, when they find a female within their territory, the males will do this U-shaped fly and they'll go back and forth and back and forth. Um, and it's extremely fast how they're doing this. And you can even hear their wings are making this really interesting noise. And once he finds a female who is receptive to him, um, then the next step is he will go over to the branch that she's sitting on. And um, I've actually been able to see this on, in our backyard at the sanctuary. He, when, she, when he finds that she's receptive, he'll start doing the second dance, which is a back and forth motion, which is absolutely amazing because their hummingbirds are, are amazing because they can fly sideways. So he's doing a back and forth motion and he's making the sound with, with his wings. And he is trying to get the attention of the female. If she's receptive, then um, they will mate and then he's done and he moves on. Um, it's, it's really believed that the male during the summertime, he, once he finds enough females, then he's, he's going to migrate. So I found um, through our research data that by almost uh, mid-July, where our, our ruby throat, our males are actually, are, they're starting to migrate and we're getting in new males that aren't in the, in the territory um, and because they're starting to migrate. And we can see that from the data because if I'm catching a bunch of humming, male hummingbirds time after time, and then I don't catch these birds any longer, um, then, then I can start to figure out that they're starting to migrate. So that's a, a way of banding, sharing information um, with, with folks. What's even interesting in banding is that when I'm banding, I can actually turn a, a female over and I blow in her um, abdomen area. And uh, during her breeding, if she's got an egg, I can see the egg because her, um, her uh, abdomen is translucent and you can you can actually see the egg you can see where she's gravid um, and she's got a fluid filled sac and um, that's where she's uh, regulating those eggs um, and so um, in a couple of slides I'm going to actually show you how many breeders we have at the sanctuary um, so that's a little about the differences between the male and the female um, I could probably go on for hours um, to talk about ruby throats, but um, I'm just about ready to wrap up. But I just want to share just a little bit of the information that we're finding at the sanctuary um, because I think it's important because banding informs us. It informs us if our habitat has changed. Um, it informs us if our native plants aren't growing and we're not providing the food source. If, uh, if we 
used to have a pond and we no longer have uh, water uh, in that pond, that may affect um, what we do to be able to protect these birds. So birds are extremely important. They're the canaries in the coal mine, as, as a lot of people have heard, and um, ruby throats are no different. So here's a little bit of data, and I love sharing this because people will say, oh, data is boring, but this information I think is absolutely thrilling. So in, in last year, in 2020, um, I banded 544 new birds at the Mary Grade Bird Sanctuary. That's a lot of birds and a lot of banding. And I try to band about, I would say, two to three nights per week um, during breeding season. Because my research question, I'm trying to ask, when do these birds come back? When are they breeding? When do we start seeing a female with eggs? Uh, when do we stop seeing our adult males that have been coming to our feeders? And, uh, and then what's that lifespan? So when do we start seeing young? And, and then who's coming back? So most of these birds, um, their mortality rate is, is extremely high. So our birds about, uh, in the ruby-throated hummingbird world, only about 25% make it through their first year. So that's an extremely low number, which makes sense that they're having four young. So if I'm raising four young and I'm hoping that at least one is successful and makes it back into that next year, then, then I've replaced myself um, when, when, I, when I no longer exist. Um, most people think that, um, assume, and we need a lot more banding data, um, the average of all hummingbirds, so if we're not just specifically talking about ruby throats, we talk about all hummingbirds, their average age is anywhere between, they, they can live seven to nine years on average. That ruby throats are probably a little lower. Um, it's really assumed that they'll live about three to five years but that's if they make it out of their first year and 75% of them don't make it out of that. And that's, and a lot of our data actually shows that. Um, and in 2020, we had 122 recaptured birds. Now these are not birds of the new birds. These aren't new birds that I've recaptured over and over again at the feeders. These are birds that we've recaptured from years past. So I had 122 birds come back. Of those 122 that came back, we ended up having two birds that were at least six years old. So, um, and, and of course they were females. Uh, this last year, I, I have a little graph over here, a, a chart to show you the sex ratio. And it was really interesting because the sex ratio was 50-50 um, this last year. So we, we um, and that's out of the new birds that we captured. Um, on the recaptured birds, we have a lot more females that make it through, the, make it back. Um, and to give you an idea of how many breeding birds we have, ruby throats that we have at the sanctuary, um, I wanted to put up this little, this uh, graph, this chart. And um, so of the new birds that we had, we found 37 females had eggs. Of the recap birds, so the birds that had come back, all those 122 of the birds came back, 52 of them had eggs. So breeding wise, the Mary Gray Bird Sanctuary is showing that we're a significant breeding area for the ruby-throated hummingbirds. Um, and it, it's, a, it's an important breeding location for them. So um, we have a lot of, of uh, gravid female means that she either is raising her young or she has some, she has her eggs. And the last thing that I wanted to show you is um, the males and the females. And these are recaptured. So these are recaptured birds um, from 2015 when I 
started uh, learning how to band. And then by 2019, the number of birds that have come back to the sanctuary. So if you look at 2015, 2016, and 2017, that blue, the blue indicates that um, it was only females that returned to the Mary Gray Bird Sanctuary that in 2015, 2016, and 2017. And it was a small number. I wasn't banding a lot at that point in time, um, but we, we did have some that returned and we had no males that had that returned um, through 2015, 2016, 2017. However, when you start to look at 2018 and 2019, the males started returning. Why? I'm not quite sure, um, but we, we had a lot um, of birds returning. And each year you can see that um, the more I band, the more birds that we have coming back with bands um, and uh, we have, it's a large population of females that, that come back. So the females, um, they not only raise their young and do um, a significant part of the breeding uh, in their life, um, but they also tend to live longer um, and they, they tend to come back to the same location. So at that point, I think I've given you everything that I have, and we are going to open this up to questions because I know folks um, always have questions about the hummingbirds, and um, I think it's, um, I will try to try my best to answer anything that anyone wants to throw out at me. And I'm going to throw it back over to Sam and Joni, and they are going to field some of your questions. You want, you want me to go ahead, Sam? Okay. Sure, go for it. All right. We had a question from Julie Jensen's asking, my question is if I'm putting up feeders at a new house, is it better to have Southern or Eastern exposure? That's a fantastic question. And I am going to tell you, I truly don't think that the look that, uh, um, that that matters. But what you do want to do is you don't want to have that feeder in full sun and you don't really want to have it in full shade. So, um, but you do want to have protection around it. So if it's a new home, what I would do is look at the habitat that you have and make sure that where you do put that feeder up, that, that those birds have some type of protection um, in order for them to come to your feeders. They'll, they'll come to your feeders more often if there are some brush, um, a brush around. Uh, we have a lilac tree and a red bud tree uh, real close to the house, which um, gives them the protection to go to the feeders and, and go away from, and then to sit and perch for a while. So um, for, from my perspective, that's what I would be more interested in. And then plant some native plants. Okay. Beth asks, um, she says, we soften our water with salt. Do we need to use bottled water? I don't think that it's necessary. Um, I, we, um, at the sanctuary, we have a water softener and um, it doesn't seem, with the number of birds that we have, it really doesn't seem like it's a consequence of it. So I, um, from, from my opinion, I probably wouldn't worry about that. That's a great question. Kathy B asked, do they always have just always lay two eggs? I knew someone would ask this. It is possible for uh, a female to have three eggs. However, because of the energy that it takes um, and the time that she would have to take care of three, um, it would be extremely difficult on her biology wise. So most, I um, would say almost a, a significant amount only have two eggs at a time because that's as much that she can raise energetically. Okay. And Jenny Haybecker asks, um, what native plants would you recommend? Oh, that's great. Is uh, Sharon Sorensen on here by chance? Was she able to log in? Oh, no, someone else had the same question on Facebook. Yeah, I know. Native so. plants are really, they're <laughs> extremely important. So pick native plants that are in your area and that are easy. Well, almost all of them are easy to grow because they're in the, we're in the right place. 
Um, a couple of native plants that I particularly like, um, I, we have, um, one of my favorites is actually Royal Catchfly. I just, I love that plant because it's red. Um, Cardinal Flower is another great one. It's a little more difficult to grow. Um, even Bergamot, Bergamot is excellent. Um, and Bergamot, your butterflies will also um, love it. Um, anything, so uh, there are some native honeysuckles uh, that you can use. Of course, they like a uh, tubular uh, type of flower. They don't need to be red. Um, they do have a preference. Uh, they will, they kind of prefer red, um, but they don't have to be. Um, and coneflower, um, find a neighbor, uh, find a friend who has some coneflower and throw it out in your yard because those are native too. Uh, and uh, while we're on this topic, um, because it, there is a large list of native plants, um, there's a native plant society that has a list of all the native plants in Indiana. Um, but I will also highly recommend uh, Sharon Sorensen recently in the last few years came out with a book um, of native plants in your yard. Um, and it gives you step-by-step -step instructions of what kind of natives that you would like uh, that are easy to, easier to raise, what they look like, how tall they'll get, and what kind of birds tend to come to the, um, t come to the areas. Uh, so I highly recommend it. I'll say it one more time. It's Sharon Sorensen, and she is in Indiana, and she has two absolutely fabulous books out. So if you're looking for recommendations, um, the Native Plant Society and, uh, and Sharon Sorensen's book, great information. Amy, is that book Planting Native to Attract Birds to Your Yard? Yes, it is. Perfect. And I, I, I was actually trying to find, I were moving, so I was trying to find it so I could show you it. It's a beautiful yellow book, um, great instructions, and um, it comes from one of our native folks, Sharon Sorensen. So do think about picking up one of those. You can pick them up on Amazon. Highly recommended. Another question, um, besides feeders, and this is from Tamara, besides feeders and plants they love, what draws them? Some people seem to get gazillions of them and others, not so many. So they, they, they like forested areas. So they, do, they don't care for open areas. They like the forested area, but they also like water sources. So if you've got a creek running through your backyard or side yard, um, or if you aren't getting a lot of ruby throats, one thing you might want to think about is adding a fountain, a water fountain that, um, that has water movement. Uh, that, that tends to help. Um, but again, protection is extremely important. So making sure that you have protection and that you have water and that you have natives. Those are the three things that are extremely important and that you have fresh sugar water out. If your sugar water gets old, your ruby throats will stop coming to the feeder. So those are the, so um, just making sure that you have those three things and you have fresh food out for them. Um, one last question so far. Um, do we know with the second brood, the second mating, do we have any data that shows whether that's the same male or is it a different male? Is she mating with the same male or different? That's a great, that, um, terrific question. And um, no, we don't have that data. Uh, be, and I will say probably because it would mean doing some blood draws um, and some pretty intensive research. But however, I would say that most birds are not specific to, or they don't go back to the same male uh, when they are breeding. So um, I, my assumption, and this is only an assumption and an opinion, is, is probably not the same male because they don't pair up. Um, once, once they copulate, they're done with each other and he has nothing more to do. Um, she may have a preference for him because he's a significant breeder and an important breeder, but there, but there's no research on that that I'm uh, aware of. Thank you. Uh, Sharon's on here and she says, thanks so much for your kind <laughs> words about her labor of love. The book has been successful. Thanks to support for folks like you. Yes. 
it's extremely important to support our folks in Indiana. And like I say, that the book is very informative and Sharon is extremely uh, great and terrific about uh, promoting those wild uh, native plants. So highly recommended. Thank you, Amy. That's all I have right now. Sam? Cool. I have some from the Facebook as well. Um, this You kind of answered this a little bit, but I don't know if you specifically did. Um, Gail H. was wondering if there's a best place to put your hummingbird feeder. I know you mentioned putting things around it, but. Yeah, the, and another thing is put it where you can see it. Put it where you can see it, your coffee and when you're drinking your coffee in the morning, put it in a location that you can see the, the ruby throats. So again, uh, the feeders are for our enjoyment, um, not as much for keeping the, the birds alive. I will qualify that though with saying that it's extremely important to keep them out late in late fall up through November, December if you can. You won't stop these birds from migrating, but you may help a, a late uh, leaving a, a late bird that hasn't left yet that just didn't know to leave. Um, or you may have a rarity that comes by, um, like a rufous hummingbird would not be as uncommon in Indiana as it has been in the past. So you might help keep um, a hummingbird alive. So put it somewhere where you can see it and put it somewhere where it has protection and it has a water source. Awesome. Um, Brenda H. from Facebook wanted to know, um, you talked a little bit about flowers. Do they have a specific flower? You said they like red they they like them all right natives yeah they tend to like red but you know when you need those when you when you need your nectar and you need your sugar water um or when you need your nectar and when you need uh your your protein um you're going to go to those native plants so i i don't know that they necessarily have one that they particularly um care that they want to go to um, and because everything normally blooms at different times during the year, you want to keep you, if you're putting a garden in, you would want to put natives that will bloom at different times for the birds. Awesome. Um, Kristen S. wants to know if the hummingbirds favor a certain tree species for nesting. Hey, Kristen. Um, <laughs> so they... The, what, from what I've read is a, a, some folks who are lucky enough to find nests uh, that they tend to go to sugar maple, sugar maple trees. I'm sure that there are others um, that they prefer. Uh, uh, probably beech trees would be great because it's near water um, and, and they can tolerate, like they, they like it a little swampy and usually there's a creek running not too far from, from them. Um, but, you know, when folks talk about that they found a hummingbird nest, they can nest in um, branches in a shrub um, all the way up to uh, sugar maple that's 80, 90 feet up high. So I don't think that there's necessarily a preference, but they do, they do like areas where, they, where it's forested um, and then some open areas where they can find uh, the food source. Awesome. And if anyone is looking to find an awesome breeding site for hummingbirds that uh, Amy mentioned, we're hosting the Indiana Audubon Spring Gathering is on May 1st coming up, which is at the Mary Gray Bird Sanctuary. And I'm sure Amy will have all of the feeders out and they'll be starting okay. to nest. So you can get lots of hummingbirds at that time as well. So um, I do have one more question from Facebook. Okay. Um, Kim G is wondering if hummingbirds nest near hawk nests for protection. Oh, that's an excellent question that I am going to admit I do not know. <laughs> I've not come across that information. Uh, and it, that would be interesting because uh, one of the things that um, Anusha that we from the video that we saw earlier and um, she actually talked about hawks as being a predator. Um, the smaller sharp chin hawks could be predators of the ruby throat. So um, I don't have a good answer to that, but I'm sure we can find it out. We'll look that up after. <laughs> we will look that up. Or someone's researching it right now. You never yes, know. I'm sure. <laughs> awesome. Well, if there aren't. But I, but I will, and I will add one thing is that 
you know, when you start to Google search um, and you start to do some research on hummingbirds, one of the things that I find is that some, some places will say, oh, a ruby throat lives two to five, two to four years. Some folks, some other places will say two to six years. Um, and I think that the reason why I put the question mark in my presentation is that there's no one answer that's right. Uh, there, we still have a lot of questions and we're, we're, we'll probably never have all of the answers, but we're trying to find those. Um, but it is very, it's various when you go to different sites and you do some of the research. Um, I use a lot of the Birds of the World um, that is provided by the Indiana Audubon Society. Um, that is a, a great wealth of knowledge that you get included with your membership. So you might want to think about something like that if you if you're really interested in finding out more about the ruby throats or any other bird. Awesome. All right. Well, um, someone did bring up a good point. Just not a question so much for you, Amy, but this presentation is recorded. Um, you can also watch it on Facebook if you'd like that, but it will be uploaded to the Indiana Audubon YouTube page the, within the week. So um, yeah, if there aren't any other questions, just right. want to thank you so much, Amy, for coming out and doing this. Sure we really thing. appreciate it. All right. Get those feeders up. Be prepared. All right. Everybody have a good night. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>